flags nationwide were lowered to half-mast as here in Rome, as overburdened hospitals and healthcare workers struggled to cope. Italy remains the epicenter of the pandemic in Europe, with almost 102,000 people infected. A nationwide lockdown has been in place for weeks, and the government has warned that it could go on for much longer. And joining me now from Rome is correspondent Sima Gupta. So, you know, it's striking really to see this shift in Italy since the outbreak began. I mean, we, we had videos a few weeks ago of residents on balconies singing, and now, silence. You're absolutely right, Sarah. I mean, it's from singing to silence, singing for solidarity, and silence, really, to remember all the victims, the more than 11,500 victims, uh, people who have died with COVID-19, as well as to honour the healthcare workers that are fighting uh, this uh, infection, this uh, infectious disease. It's important to remember of that more than 11,500 victims, uh, you, did, you do have at least 61 doctors that have lost their lives to COVID-19. Now, the flags were uh, flying at half-mast all throughout Italy, as well as at the Vatican. And a real a somber reality of that staggering figure for many people to remember. That said, though, the authorities are trying to stress the fact that the number of new infections does appear to be stabilizing. And some as, uh, have pro projected that perhaps the peak of infections could arrive within the next seven to 10 days. And in the meantime, we know that residents have been under strict lockdown for weeks now. It was supposed to end on Friday, but now it's been extended until at least April 12th. That's Easter Sunday. How are people coping with such a long lockdown like this? You're, you're right. It's day 22 now of this lockdown. And uh, for a lot of families, of course, there's a massive psychological stress just being cooped up at home and having to juggle work life as well as family life and school life for their children. Uh, that's for those who are lucky enough to have jobs. Unfortunately, there are those that are really struggling literally to make ends meet because you either are unemployed or, uh, for instance, particularly in the south of the country, which is poor and has a higher unemployment rate. Uh, you have people who often do clandestine work or work in the black, as they say. Uh, even that work has run out. And so they're struggling just to buy food to feed their families. And that's why the government has set aside 400 million euros to be distributed among all the town councils uh, that they will use to set up food vouchers so that people can feed themselves and their families. And there will be an additional 4.3 billion euros of help on its way. Uh, that said, though, there is concern about the economic impact all of this is having here in Italy. And there's some concern that the European countries up north uh, should be doing more to help Italy and perhaps create a more uh, con uh, 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 solidarity in terms of helping Italy deal with its debt crisis as well. And so a lot of mayors as well as regional officials have written a letter uh, to Germany asking mm. for a greater uh, coordination as, as one has done after World War II. All kinds of measures on the table, including a so-called Corona bond. Um, Seema Gupta joining us with The View from Rome today. Thank you. reckon to have one of the best health care systems in Europe. But as with other countries, the number of confirmed coronavirus cases keeps relentlessly rising. There are now more than 67,000 confirmed cases in the country. The German government has warned that the health care system faces its biggest challenge in 75 years and already cracks are starting to show. The German city of Wolfsburg has been badly affected by the coronavirus. At least 17 people recently died in a care home. And now this hospital has been forced to stop receiving new patients after various employees tested positive. This case is an example of how the crisis in this country, which is one of the most affected in Europe, is testing the limits of its health care system. It is often considered one of the most advanced in the world. But the pandemic is also revealing its weaknesses. There are reports of staff and equipment shortages, of unnecessary bureaucracy, of lacking digitalization, and also of a frequent need to improvise. The government, and in particular the health minister, are aware of the challenges ahead. Doctors and nurses are probably preparing for the biggest challenge in 75 years. 
We already have many infected people in Germany and we also mourn many deaths. This is still the calm before the storm. Germany has comparatively few coronavirus deaths, which has partly to do with the high number of tests in the country. But this is not enough to weather the storm, and that's why a package of measures has been passed to help hospitals financially, reduce bureaucracy and expedite reaction times. And Berlin is planning to build a new hospital which could house between 500 and 1,000 patients. The government has asked for doctors to be brought out of retirement and for hospitals to suspend any non-urgent operations in order to free up intensive care beds. Germany already has more beds than many countries in Europe and that's why it has been able to bring in 50 coronavirus patients from France and from Italy. Germany sees this as European solidarity in times of crisis. But as the infection rate here continues to be too high for authorities to lift restrictions, it remains a big question whether Germany's own health system will be able to pass the test. And for more, I'm joined now by Andrew Ullmann, a member of the parliament for the German opposition party, the Free Democrats. He's also a professor of infectology. Um, thank you so much for joining us here on DW News. Are you anticipating a sharp increase in coronavirus deaths in the next weeks, in the next months? I'm afraid so that the death rates will uh, further increase here in Germany as well. We are still lucky as a country if you look at the amount of infected uh, patients and look at the numbers of deaths, we're still less than 1%. This is a very low count so far in the global community if you compare us. However, uh, those numbers will still increase even if we stay with 1%. Those uh, numbers of uh, people who succumb on COVID-19 will be increasing. Um, you mentioned that the numbers here do tend to, at least on the face of it, look better than in other areas. Um, what do you think that that is down to? I mean, is the country simply better prepared than others? And is it likely to stay that way? I'm not so quite sure if we're really well prepared. If you're looking at the shortages that we're facing for protective gear, masks, gloves, disinfection, uh, disinfectants, uh, it seems that we're not really well prepared. However, if we look at the uh, testing capacities that we have in our country, and this is spread uh, spread throughout the country, it's not only in one city, it's, these, are, these are even available in smaller cities, shows that, that we're better prepared for the testing situation than other uh, countries. Nevertheless, I think, uh, uh, we would be short of saying that we were well prepared. There are some who are out there who um, don't really believe that this virus um, is that dangerous. How do you see society right now adapting to the pandemic and, you know, the general mindset of the public? I think that the public is learning very quickly. Uh, we had here uh, some local elections just two weeks ago here in Bavaria. I was really shocked how people were still gathering in parks. We had wonderful weather here in Bavaria. And I do understand that we like to gather. However, nobody, a lot of people didn't understand the the urgency and the severity of uh, the COVID-19 crisis that we're facing. And now that we're at lockdown, uh, people start to understand and comprehend what's happening. And uh, things are changing. I see it in the grocery stores. People are keeping their distance. They have uh, coughing etiquettes that they're using. They're coughing into their, their sleeves. Uh, people uh, washing their hands more, using disinfectants if they're available. So uh, I think people are learning along this crisis as well. How about wearing face masks? Because we have a city here, Jena, the first German city to introduce the mandatory wearing of face masks. I mean, initially we were all told um, that it doesn't really make too much of a difference. The narrative seems to be changing. Where do you weigh in here? Well, the narrative is very simple. It's just that one solution or one size fits all. All the measures that we take are important, meaning uh, wearing masks, even if they are just made of cloth, they might be helpful, but they're not as good as surgical masks, of course. Uh, disinfectants for your hands, washing your hands very frequently, keeping your distance away from your uh, fellow citizens. These are all measures that are together very important, not by a single measure itself, won't, won't change anything that much, but all together, this could be very helpful. Professor Andrew Ullmann, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.
Well, let's take a look now at some other ways coronavirus is affecting people around the world. Russia has reported its biggest one-day rise in new cases, some 500, bringing the country's total to more than 2,300. Authorities in Belgium have confirmed the death of a 12-year-old girl infected with COVID-19. Although serious infections among the young remain rare, several countries have reported exceptions. And the World Health Organization is warning that even though the focus is now on Europe and the United States, the coronavirus pandemic is still, quote, far from over in Asia and the Pacific region. Well, Brazil has Latin America's highest number of reported coronavirus cases, more than 4,500. But that has not stopped the country's populist president, Jair Bolsonaro, of downplaying the danger posed by the pandemic. Brazil's health minister has openly contradicted the president, saying that people need to protect themselves through social distancing. Now, social media giants are stepping into the fray. They are removing posts showing the president disregarding public health advice. Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, likes to portray himself as a man of the people. But his closeness to the people in these images has proved too much for social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. They've now removed this video, accusing Bolsonaro of putting lives at risk by ignoring official guidelines on social distancing. But Bolsonaro is unrepentant. This total isolation, if it goes on like this, in the future, we will have a serious problem with the brutal amount of unemployment. It will take years to resolve. The president alleges his aim is to protect the poor who are suffering the most, as jobs are destroyed because of quarantine measures. He says people need to get back to work. But this stance has put him at odds not just with official advice from health professionals imploring people to stay at home, but also with a majority of Brazil's state governors and many local politicians. They're busy repurposing venues such as the Sambadrome in Rio, turning it into a shelter for the homeless and vulnerable for the duration of the pandemic, bracing for the onslaught. Everyone's appeal is stay at home. Their home is this one. It will be these spaces that are being offered. So the ideal is that they stay here and do not walk around the streets and be exposed to such a lethal virus. As the number of infections and deaths increases, another big concern is how to stop the virus spreading among the city's favelas. Here, there is often no running water or electricity, and people are increasingly dependent on food handouts. Well, an estimated one-third of the global population is living in a coronavirus lockdown with restrictions on public life and a ban on gatherings of people. Now, this has posed a serious problem for protest movements around the world, from the Fridays for Future climate strikes to Hong Kong's pro-democracy protests. But organizers, they are experimenting with online demonstrations, trying to voice their demands without gathering together. My colleague, our reporter, I mean, as if he has been following this story for us. I mean, it's good to see you here in the see studio Brent. for a change. Yeah. What is an online demonstration? What does that look like? Well, I think people are still experimenting with this. They don't really know. I mean, there's always been some kind of online activism, but this is really forcing their cards now, and they want to find out what works and what doesn't. One good example was uh, a protest organized by Zeebrücke. That's an organization here in Germany that's fighting for asylum rights. Mm -hmm. So they are concerned about uh, the concentrations of people in camps like on Moria, on Lesbos. Um, so they organized a kind of virtual march through Berlin. Uh, it had various tactics involved. One of them, uh, you can see here, they had people send uh, sound bites from Moria camp mm -hmm. asking for solidarity. They also had people uh, design banners hanging out their windows within Berlin. And they had a kind of virtual march, like I said, where they went to different institutions in Berlin and had targeted tweet campaigns or email campaigns. So basically they said, okay, everybody now is going to tweet or email or phone call uh, the uh, interior ministry in mm -hmm. Berlin. So everybody did that and they got trending. I mean, they used this hashtag, leave no one behind and it was trending. Yeah, and was the hashtag leave no one behind, was the demonstration successful? Yeah, that was uh, the number one trending hashtag 
in Germany, it even beat out COVID-19, which is wow. a big feat nowadays. Um, they had 6,000 people participate at the height of the live stream. This is all live streamed on YouTube. Um, but the question of whether or not that's effective, I posed that question uh, to one of the organizers, and here's what he had to say. Right now, we have to be creative. We have to find new ways. Uh, I think the online demonstration was, for the first thing that we actually tried and did, was a very, very good thing. Um, and also, I think for the future, you can use these online tools to uh, react on things very quickly because you can mobilize a lot of people online in a, in a short time and you don't have to organize anything for demonstrations and like uh, ask authorities for permission for the demonstrations. So you can um, activate a lot of people in a, in a short time. But I would say it's like a side tool of activism. It's not what we want to do in the future. But it's probably going to be a very uh, powerful, um, necessary tool right now. You know, there's been criticism already today of the prime minister in Hungary, Viktor Orban, who has been given the right to govern by decree. There's no way for the public really at this point to protest against it. Um, are there other examples of, of governments taking advantage of this crisis to put limits on freedom of speech? Sure there are. I think we're gonna see more and more of them as time goes on, but human rights activists have pointed out two examples. In Russia, uh, uh, the government put a ban on public gatherings the very same day that President Putin um, approved a measure that would allow him to stay in office until 2036. Mm -hmm. So the timing there was pretty obvious. Um, or suggestive anyway. And also in Iraq, there's been a protest movement going on since October, and that has come to a virtual standstill after the government put a ban on protests there uh, back in at the end of February when they only had one case of coronavirus confirmed. Now the uh, tally has risen in that country, but the ban is still effective and it's really shut down the protest movement. So I think people are going to be asking, will we get our rights back once the lockdown is yeah, over? Yeah, rights can become endangered, especially when people are living in fear. Amin Esif, as always, Amin, thank you. Thanks, Brian.